Welcome everyone. We are at our official start time of 6 p.m. Mountain Time, so we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Mekri Ann and I'm a course facilitator with SFW. I'll be providing tech support during the call this evening, so if you have any questions or concerns, please direct it to the chat module in the bottom center of your screen. We would also love to know where everyone is zooming in from this evening, so please direct that to the chat module as well. And please remain aware that this will be different from the Q&A module where you will put your questions. At this time, I would love to turn it over to our director and founder, Reed Callanan. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Mecca. Thank you for setting us up so nicely for this special evening with our great friend, Manuela. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Just to set the stage here for Creativity Continues, um, we have uh, over 450 people that have registered for this class. Well, I shouldn't say class, um, for this webinar, for this lecture. Um, we have um, a little over 100 people right now on board, live, more will tumble in. I think a lot of people will be watching this recording, but good numbers. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to have all of you join our Santa Fe Workshops online community, which is growing. We're now three years into this online community forged by the pandemic, obviously, and it's been a great success for us in Santa Fe. One of the silver linings of the pandemic, as far as I'm concerned. And we have enough traction now that we've actually are building an, an online community of folks that have never been to Santa Fe or San Miguel that have just, just know us online. And that's okay too. Um, I'm, I'm fine with that as long as community is what is happening and it is here. So thank you for joining us for this, this um, lecture from Manuela, which um, my, my title for this talk is The Joys and the Angst of being an artist. Now, many times we hear about the creative process and the joys and the ease of that and all the, the wonderful parts of that which uh, enhances our lives. We don't hear so much about the other side, which is, which is uh, certainly viable and is a big part of every creative process. And that's the frustrating part, the, uh, the parts of self-doubt and rejection and is this good enough? And I think every creative person asks those questions quietly and maybe behind the scenes. And this evening, Manuela has the courage to step up and offer that up kind of front and center. At least that's my interpretation of what she's gonna be presenting. We'll hear from her in a second in terms of what she um, wants to present and then going into her probably 45 or 50 minute presentation. And then uh, Mecca and I will take your questions. So as Mecca said, put them in the Q&A feature, not the chat feature, the Q&A feature, which is just to the right of the chat feature. That's where we want you to put your questions of Manuela. And Mecca and I will take turns at the end of the program to ask your questions of Manuela. And that's always a really fun interactive part of these programs. So please um, do be thoughtful and ask questions because it is an important part of this process. So we first uh, became aware of Manuela about two years ago. Uh, she was introduced to me by our mutual friend, April Milani, who said Manuela Thames is somebody who is um, a good candidate for online teaching with you folks. She had taught with um, April at the Gather Academy and um, April being a great friend that she is of ours, she um, kind of turned her over to us and it's been just uh, a great two years since then. Uh, she's taught uh, only online, although this summer she's coming to Santa Fe to teach in person, which we're excited about. Uh, the online classes are around self-portraiture, and then she did a workshop, a number of workshops called um, Double Take, which focuses in on multiple exposures, diptychs, um, ways to be more inventive and um, more artful in your photography. So um, she came to this country 20 years ago now from Germany. And I think that um, kind of duality of being born and raised in Germany and then coming to this country helps to give her the insights that, um, that artists look for when they create their work. And she certainly has amassed uh, a really uh, interesting body of work. A lot of it's self-portraiture. A lot of it asks questions about who she is as an artist, as a mother, uh, as a citizen of this planet. And um, those questions are what a lot of creative people ask. So um, 
her message is important and um, she's important to us as a teacher and a part of our community. So um, I'm happy to, to introduce her to you. So Mecca, if you can bring Manuela on board with us this evening, there she is. Hi, it's good to Hi. see you Manuela. Thank you for agreeing to, um, to give this lecture that's on a um, important topic, but not one that's oftentimes, I think, talked about openly, the, the <laughs> doubts of being an artist. And um, before I turn it over to you, I wanted to, to read a passage that I think still leads off your Instagram feed by Rilke. And oh. that, that quote is, the only journey is the one within. And I think that Manuela and her art follows that, uh, that wonderful pat, that wonderful words from Rilke, because so much of what we um, do in the world and see in the world comes from our perceptions of it. And that's what um, true artists do. And I would say that uh, from my perspective, Manuela is a true fine artist and we're pleased to have her. So what do you have to say about um, the evening ahead? You wanna give us a yeah. little preview or do you wanna jump in or what's, what's your- Yeah, I'm just, um, well, first of all, I wanna thank you and welcome everyone. Um, and thank you so much for joining uh, me this evening. And just thank you, Reed, for the kind introduction and thank you, Mecca, for facilitating um, and being an all around support and help. I've really been quite fortunate to be able to work for Santa Fe workshops and teach my own courses. I recommend this place to anyone and I always talk highly about it, not because I teach there and not only because countless amazing world renowned instructors have taught and teach there but because of the team that holds everything together. Reed, as the founder of this place and all the other team members in their different roles, you've always treated me with kindness and respect. And when I went through a family emergency at the end of last year and I was in the middle of teaching a class, I will never forget the support, kindness and compassion I received from all of you. I mean this in all sincerity. This is a good place with some great education. Thank you, this Manuela. Um, I'm yeah. gonna bow out now with my video, turn my video off and yes. we'll be in the background. We'll let you um, go at it with, um, with our group here, which is growing by leaps and bounds right now. We're up to 150. So All if you're right. still tuning in to, um, to this, this um, presentation. So um, I'll turn off my video, I'll be in the background. And we'll mm -hmm. come back um, when you're done roughly quarter of or 10 of the hour. Does that work for you? That works for me. Okay, yeah. great. All righty. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to be sharing my screen here. Yeah, all looks good. All right, thanks. <laughs> This evening, I want to introduce you to some of my work and talk about my process. I will introduce you to two of my fine art series I created um, within the last few years and a few examples of other bodies of work. Um, as Reed said, I'm mostly known for my self-portraiture and portraiture as well. I enjoy both digital and film. I use a lot of long exposure to create movement, and I love using multiple images and combining them into one piece of art, be it through multiple exposures or by using diptychs or triptychs. I also really enjoy manipulating my prints um, of my images by adding a variety of elements to it, cutting or tearing them apart and putting them together in a different way. As I am sharing my work, I want to talk about creativity and the creative process in general. And in particular, I want to focus on a part of being an artist that we don't like to talk about very much. The inevitable times of creative blocks the fear and uncertainty 
we experience as artists when we create and put the work out into this world. I want to begin by sharing a body of work with you that I created about a year ago. It is my 18 piece series titled Torn, in which I created images out of monochromatic prints, old and new, digital and analog. I had some freshly new film roles developed at the time. I started this series shortly after the start of the Ukrainian war. And this series examines the effects and realities of living in a country at war, a beautiful country with beautiful people torn apart. Through the process of creating these images and the results, I visualized the darkness, grief, and pain, but I also visualize beauty, strength, resilience, and courage. I used images of landscapes, flowers and trees and self-portraits and tore them apart to create burials for the dead and graves for people buried alive. You can see tears and dirt and sweat. You can see families torn apart and people escaping to safer places. You can see underground shelters and war wounds, both physical and emotional. The wounds that will heal and the scars that remain. I recreate these realities that are hard to face and difficult to think about. The realities we avoid and find too depressing and sad. Like a lot of people, I initially reacted strongly to the start of the war. I followed all the developments and woke up to the news. For days and weeks, I was glued to my phone. Of course, I cannot speak for someone who currently lives in a war zone and is part of the daily terror. I know that I'm not directly the victim of war trauma, but my parents and grandparents were. I had done a lot of research into my family history for another series that I will introduce you to, interviews with relatives and some research on generational trauma. It was eye-opening and such an important part of understanding myself, my parents, um, my upbringing and my struggles. I have deep admiration for my grandparents who went through so many horrific things while raising small children. My paternal grandfather was born in Ukraine and lived there for a while, although he was German. And my paternal grandmother was born in Poland. I can't tell you exactly how they ended up in East Germany, not too far from Berlin. Um, but that's where my father grew up and that's where they experienced many tragic and difficult events caused by World War II. I'm telling you this just to explain um, to some extent why the start of the Ukrainian war felt somewhat personal and I wanted to create some work to express it. I love these images and I feel proud of the fact that I was able to translate my reactions, thoughts and emotions into a visual story. When I started tearing the images, I did it with the goal of creating something new and beautiful, not with the goal to destroy, as it may seem at first. When I began, it was a more intuitive process, but after a while it became a much more deliberate and organized project. I paid attention to where exactly I would place the tear, and I experimented with texture by using soil and dust and water. When re-photographing the images, I would also pay attention and include in some images, the reflections of the light source I used. I really enjoyed the process of this project a lot. And the more I worked on it, the more inspired I felt and more courageous and I became and convinced that this body of work that I wanted to, um, 
that I wanted to share with the world. So I did. I submitted these images um, to several galleries, online publications and magazines, and I received more rejections than I had in a very long time. Sometimes I would get into a final round, but then I didn't make it further. Sometimes I didn't make it past any round at all. Um, rejection after rejection after rejection. We don't tell you about this a lot, but rejections are part of being an artist, part of being a professional. And it's a challenging part of being an artist, but this time it felt particularly challenging. And I started to question myself and my work and fell into the all too familiar comparison trap. What followed was a bit of a rough time to say the least. I talk in my workshops about how to deal with rejection, but I found it incredibly hard to follow my own advice. In addition to all of this, life threw challenges at me that kept me occupied and took a lot of mental strength, you know, like life does for everyone. And there I was, I had sunk into a hole. I was in a creative rut and I wouldn't touch my camera for months and weeks at a time. As a creative person, I have been fortunate to experience many highs of an artist's life. The highs are the times when I'm working on an image or a new project and I feel the inspiration, I feel the ideas flowing, I have an urge to create and nothing can stop me. And I'm confident that I have the skills to execute my ideas. I feel at ease with my work. Even if the work is hard or at times frustrating, my vision is clear and I work diligently as long as it takes to get there. It's thrilling, honestly. It's like nothing else exists except me and my vision and nothing can restrain it. It's the best, it's exciting, ecstatic. It's like living in a bubble of creative bliss until the bubble bursts. As a creative person, I have been unfortunate, but perhaps one could also say fortunate to experience the lows of an artist's life. The lows are the times when I feel like I lost all my creative abilities, when I have no ideas, no motivation, and when everything I try to do makes me feel stuck. It is when I'm experiencing a creative block. We all know it, at least I assume, <laughs> and it's not fun. In my 16 years as a fine art photographer, I have told my husband the following words several times. I am done. I knew it was all a fluke. I'm not an artist. I'm not a photographer. How could I think that I was? I can't take a decent picture of anything anymore. I have zero inspiration. It's gone, completely gone. And it's never coming back, ever. And every single time my husband says, mostly patiently, you have said this so many times and every time you get it back, sometimes it takes longer, sometimes not as long, but it always happens. Don't you remember the last time this happened? And then a few weeks later, you created all these new images. My usual answer is, but this time it's different. This time it's permanent. And his response is, that's what you said last time. It feels terrible to be in the spot, to be honest. I know it's common and it happens, um, but yeah, nobody really talks about it. But it happens to a lot of creators. We talk about the writer's block, for example, but that's no help when I'm in it. Um, and it's kind of difficult to see how there could be anything good in this experience at all. I was curious how, um, of how creative rut or creative block is defined. So I looked it up. One definition 
I found on a website that caught my eye says that a creative rut is an internal dilemma that stops you from producing creative content quickly and consistently. Honestly, I am not the biggest fan of this definition. I agree that a creative block is an internal dilemma between what you aspire to do and what you find yourself able to do. But what I worry about with regards to this particular definition are the words producing, quickly, and consistently. Words like these have become way too important, in my opinion. In so many areas of modern, modern life, we are inundated with the message that the measure of success is determined by producing quick and consistent results. In other words, according to this definition, if you aren't measuring up to the standard of efficiency and consumption, you are experiencing a creative block. And you're losing the momentum to be successful. And if you're going through a time where you aren't producing work that is received the way you think it should be, you are not successful. As someone who has experienced these times of inner dilemma and paralysis, I would like to suggest that perhaps the very idea of what it means to be in a creative rut such as the idea given in that definition could be a cause of getting into a creative rut in the first place. I would further suggest that this is because times of not being productive, and I mean that in the sense of producing results that I'm happy with, of not quite knowing where to go next, of not being quick and consistent, again, when it comes to results that I'm happy with are an important part of the creative process itself. First, we are not machines that could nor should consistently produce work by pushing a button. And this is especially true of us in our creative dimensions. Creativity is something we may be able to cultivate and encourage, but it's never something that can be simply switched on at will. Times of non-productivity or lack of inspiration or are part of our existence as creative beings. But, that if we, but what if we look at these times of unproductivity and lack of inspiration in a different way? Can we possibly look at it as a time of growth that can ultimately feed and enhance our creativity? To understand how to cope with a creative block is something we must endure at times to get to where we're supposed to go next. I think we need to shift our thinking away from the product or result and onto the creative process itself. But in order to do that, we must first understand how creativity works. What is creativity? Again, I was curious what others have said and looked up a couple of brief definitions on the internet. Oops. Sorry. Here. <clears throat> One of the definitions I found online says, the use of the imagination or original ideas, especially in the production of an artistic work. Wikipedia says, creativity is a phenomenon whereby something new and valuable is formed. And according to an article I found on Psychology Today, creativity encompasses the ability to discover new and original ideas, connections and solutions to problems. These definitions have a lot of merit, but they also focus predominantly on the results, uh, production, especially a product that is new and original. What's lacking 
is an emphasis on how creativity itself, to use the words of the well-known music producer and author Rick Rubin, is a way of being in this world. He calls this the real work of the artist. Rubin explains that creativity is nurtured by an awareness, an awareness of our surroundings, an awareness of the good and the bad in the world, an awareness of the beautiful and the ugly and embracing all of it, rather than trying to hide, suppress or flee from it. Creativity as a, is a way of being that takes this awareness and expresses it in a way that touches the experiences of others and draws them into a similar kind of awareness. If we think about our work this way, it shifts our focus in three ways that are relevant to the experience of a creative block. First, it reminds us that those times when our production is lacking, maybe, though, maybe those in which we can focus on cultivating that awareness that nurtures creativity. In our no noisy and fast paced world, we as creatives need times to simply practice awareness. We might need to nurture ourselves in different ways through reading, writing, listening, and simply being. It might be a time of observation, allowing our awareness to form and grow, being more conscientious in our daily activities, taking in our surroundings, processing events with honesty and thoughtfulness, allowing our awareness of the world to mature and cultivate, which can feed the creative instinct and our imagination. We also have to consider that we as humans, uh, as human beings are constantly changing and our world around us is changing. And that's actually a good thing because it can really refresh our creative minds, but we have to be aware of it. Second, and this is something I learned from Rick Rubin as well, creativity is an interplay between play and experimentation on the one hand and structure and discipline on the other. Both sides are essential in our creative practice and finding the balance between those two pairs is key. That balance is quite delicate and it varies at different times in our life. Creativity needs structure and discipline just as much as it needs play and experimentation. Without structure, commitment, and discipline, we might never finish anything. Without play and experimentation, we won't be able to let go of perfection, embrace our failures, and we're losing possibly the joy and the focus. In times of a creative block, we probably need more play and experimentation, but perhaps we also need more structure and discipline. Perhaps living for a while with more structure and discipline can release the playful and experimental side of ourselves. When the weight of expectation for an artist is carried by the playful and experimental side, structure and discipline can relieve some of that burden. Finding the balance between those two pairs is mysterious and honestly, sometimes or mostly confusing. But I strongly believe all four are needed for a creative project. Third, when the focus is on creativity as a way of being that takes awareness and expresses it in a way that touches the experiences of others and draws them into a similar kind of awareness, the goal becomes one of connecting and contributing rather than receiving and being successful. Moreover, it removes the burden of associating creativity with originality, which can be a major stumbling block as well. 
we are beings that inhabit a world that we didn't create, which we share together with others, and in which meaning and value are things we learn as we go through life, rather than things we make up. In the same way, every creative idea that we have comes from somewhere. Every creative work is inspired by the creative ideas of others. We connect with it, inspiration happens, and we sit down and do our own work. The result is unique because we are unique, not because it has never been done before. The originality of our work comes from us, from being aware, being vulnerable and authentic, not because we came up with something no one else has ever thought of. And it's for this very same reason that um, what we say or what we show might resonate with someone else. As interconnected beings, there's always the possibility that some awareness I express some way I find to present an idea or a feeling might help someone else process a similar experience. But again, this isn't because what I did was original in the most common uh, understanding. If it was truly original, it may not have any connection with anyone else. Rather, it's because what I created was human. So during times when we're not producing, that may be a time where we need to be connecting. Creativity as a way of being is not, not distinguishing yourself from others, but connecting with others. And this connection can often happen during those times when you're less focused on your own original contributions and more on what you learn from listening and receiving. To sum up, a creative block for an artist is often experienced as a time when you are unable to find new and original artistic expression. According to standard definitions, this means you are unable to produce efficiently and consistently or that what you do produce isn't the way, isn't received the way you expected or hoped. I have suggested that creativity is best understood as a way of being that is rooted in awareness, involves a balance of play and experimentation with structure and discipline, and acknowledges interconnectivity and giving in both the source and the purpose of creative activity. This supports three responses to the experience of creative blocks, to see it as a time to cultivate the awareness at the heart of creativity, to embrace the structure and discipline that is the counterpart of play and experimentation, and to nurture the forms of connection and belonging that remind us that creativity is less about originality and more authentic expression that resonates with others. When I think about it this way, I find it personally extremely freeing. Where does fear and uncertainty come into this? Fear and uncertainty are two other inevitable parts of the creative process, obviously closely connected to experiencing a creative block. The fear of the unknown, the fear of not being good enough, the fear of failing, fear of criticism, fear of judgment. Uncertainty of how people will react, uncertainty of capabilities, uncertainty of the result, I don't think we can exclude fear and uncertainty from our creative existence, but we can live with it and continuously overcome it by focusing on our creative practice as a way of being. By including play and experiment, 
structure and discipline in a balanced way into our creative process. We can overcome it through understanding that we are not creating for ourselves, but that we as artists have the gift and responsibility to create, to connect through our stories, experiences, and our unique vision of the world. Here is a second body of work that I want to share with you. It's another self-portrait series called Trauma. I created it a couple years ago. Um, I created a variety of self-portraits in my living room with a black sheet that I hung up on our bookcase. I used a lot of or experimented and played a lot with long exposure and experimented with movement to create shapes and patterns. I then printed out the images and looked at them one by one, had them all on my table. I knew I wanted to do something with them and I wanted to, to use other materials to create my message. I did some tearing of images again. Apparently I love doing it. I used white string and white tape as a contrast and some dust from the same bookshelf where I hung up my black sheet. It took a while to create each individual, individual image, but whenever I felt the result was final, I then re-photographed the images and slowly it came all together. It was quite a healthy process for me to create these images. This series that um, received that kind of recognition and acknowledgement that I was hoping for, it was received very well and it was seen by an international audience in a variety of places and countries. It was, of course, of course, wonderful to receive as much recognition. But I can also say that the highs from that time faded rather quickly when it was all over. I can honestly say that I put just as much of myself into my series Torn as I put into my series Trauma. And I love them both equally, but the reception of these two bodies of work was quite different. I could say something about the, it could say something about the quality, of course. And we should be examining our work and take feedback seriously and learn from it. But more than that, what this is telling me is that we have very little control over the reception of how our work is perceived. We have very little control of whether our work gets shown, praised and recognized. It depends on so many factors and thus we're living with an enormous amount of uncertainty. <clears throat> Let me just get some water. If we step back from the result and focus on the process, it's easier, I think, to live with that kind of uncertainty. And we sort of can separate ourselves from the outcome and not let the outcome define who we are as artists. I've been thinking a lot about the purpose of art. I've been thinking a lot about the purpose of my art. Who cares, right? What am I doing? Why am I creating this? And I've come to the conclusion that I don't believe that the purpose of my art is to hang in a gallery temporarily. Though it is a very important part of an artist's life and it's quite an important part um, to share your work. But the purpose of my art is to express my vision to show something that others 
might not see and to do it in the most authentic and best way possible. I think that it is such a, a beautiful side of art that we often forget about because it's not on our resume. It's not on our list of accomplishments. It doesn't say that I made this and that person feel less alone, that another felt deeply touched by a series I worked on for months. But when I think back on all the years and back on all the accomplishments that I received, the emails that said, I am pleased to inform you, the evenings I spend at exhibition openings, all those moments are thrilling, but so fleeting. I get really excited and I'm proud of myself. I enjoy the attention, of course. But then I go back to my ordinary days at home, my ordinary moments of work and issues and problems. And the highs come down quickly. But the moments of true connection that happened through my art, the moments someone thanked me for creating something that changed them, for making someone feel seen, for challenging somebody, those are the moments that stick with me. Creativity as a way of being is a practice that can be developed over time. It takes practice, just as any other skill. But it's the skill we need to move. We need, sorry, it's the skill we need to move our focus away from the product, the results, the awards, and everyone and every, everything one ought to achieve to be successful. Is any of this easy to do? Of course not. I think practicing creativity as a way of being is very challenging, especially because we live in a world full of expectations, obligations, and distractions. But it is an essential skill to practice because I believe it is the foundation of anything that we might create and put out into this world. So how does the story of my most recent creative block end? It has taken a long time and it, it was hard, it was really hard, but I did get back into creating and using my camera. It, it was definitely a daily fight with my thoughts to keep going, to keep writing, to keep teaching, keep exploring, keep enjoying and experimenting only to get some failed attempts of an idea. I couldn't get it out or translate it into an image, not in a way I was happy with. But all of failed attempts are essential in, just, in this journey. It's all part of it. I'm happy to say that I have a vision that excites me for a project that includes old family photographs. Nothing is finished yet, but I have a vision again, and it's very exciting. Among other things, it, um, it was influenced by a podcast I listened to, a talk I listened to, and somebody's work I admire. It seems like I needed all those different parts, and I, they needed to come all together for me to come up with my own unique vision for this work. And so now I am going to sit down and I'm going to experiment and play and I'm going to create structure 
And I also will come up with discipline to not give up on it and continue until this project is ready to be shared. I want to end tonight by sharing one other quote that seems to sum up perfectly what I was trying to express. And the quote is by Rick Rubin, once again. <laughs> All art is a work in progress. It's helpful to see the piece we are working on as an experiment. One in which we can't predict the outcome. Whatever the result, we will receive useful information that will benefit the next experiment. If you start from the position that there's no right or wrong, no good or bad, and creativity is just free play with no rules, it's easier to submerge yourself joyfully in the process of making things. We're not playing to win, we're playing to play. And ultimately, playing is fun. Perfectionism gets in the way of fun. A more skillful goal might be to find comfort in the process, to make and put out successive works with ease. All right. Well, there was a lot there and it is recorded, folks. When there was a question about recordings and yes, these lectures are recorded. They will live on our website under the Creativity Continues pull down. So you can go back and uh, listen to these again and again if you choose to. And we have um, a quite an archive built up of these lectures for the last um, three years. So it's a great resource uh, at sanfairworkshops.com. So I'll, I'll give you folks a chance to put some questions for Manuela into the Q&A feature. We've got a few in there now, but we'd like a few more. So take your time and think about what you'd like to ask Manuela. Um, I have a question for you about, um, about making art that is successful and making prints that are successful in your eyes. How important is it to share those images outside of your your studio, your your family, yourself. How important is it to get um, prints on the wall, to get um, into shows, into competitions? It, it sounds like you do that quite a bit, right? You send work out. Mm -hmm. um, some artists I know are happy just to create the work and they don't care what happens to it after that. They're not really into sharing it. Mm -hmm. um, what, what's that dichotomy look like for you? Is it really important to share it? Does it, does it give it credence when it's shared and accepted? Um, does it move beyond your liking it? Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that, um, that process of sharing your work as an artist. Yeah, no, I think it is, it's, it's extremely important. And um, again, like I, th I think that the, um, when you when you get accepted or when you get an accept, acceptance email, I mean it's such a high and it's it's so exciting and it means so much and you want to share it with other people and you know they congratulate you. It's it's a great thing, um, but I I think for a while, it, at least in my personal experience, it was something I focused too much about and when I don't get that, when I don't get those highs, when there's times of rejection, when I mean, we all experience it, you know, it, it feels, it, it feels like, um, yeah, I can get crushed, right? I can suddenly think of myself, oh gosh, I'm not successful anymore. Um, and I guess with this kind of, with, with my lecture, with, with my thoughts, um, I don't want to take the importance of sharing because, because honestly, as artists, we all want to be seen. We all want to be heard as people. Um, so I think sharing is actually very important. You know, whether you do it at a local art show or you sent it somewhere to another country, I think it's very important. And it's also important to get the feedback, you know, and it's also important for other people to see it. But I think, what I was talking about was really something that happens on the inside, you know, kind of separating 
myself from that a little bit and 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 focusing more um of the you know like i said the, the way of uh, creativity as as being in the world that that's what i'm stuck with at home on a daily basis and those successes they come and go i mean they're they just you can't rely on that but i think if you look at yourself and if you think of creativity in a different way that's something you can rely on mm -hmm. do you find that your impressions of one of your pieces of art um, change based on uh, an acceptance or a rejection by somebody else i have thought about that i really have and i will say that was part of the struggle i experienced last year mm -hmm. um, it was really questioning. Yes, I think it's a very natural response to start questioning mm -hmm. myself um, and to think, okay, I guess this is really no good, or maybe it's too dark, or maybe it's too similar, or whatever, you know, whatever, whatever. I, I mm -hmm. just don't, I think that um, as artists, we have this incredible gift to see things that others don't. We have this incredible mm -hmm. gift to express something visually that you know we can't find words for and that others can't find words for at all. And we have this incredible gift to do so. And I think we have the responsibility to share that gift with other people. And with this body of work that I created last year, it was something I had to do. It was something I wanted to do. It was something that came out of me. And I'm still, I am still proud of it. You know, it did get published eventually. And there was some, some of that. And, um, and it, it just was a very different experience. But I can honestly say that I love that body of work just as much as the other one. Um, and I, I really do. And it was a really important thing for me to create. Great, thank you. Becca, do you have some questions from our group? Yes, I do. So the first question I wanted to start off with is, what research or resources do you recommend regarding flow state um, in regards to mental health or navigating creativity? Oh, oh gosh, flow state. <laughs> uh, can you explain that <laughs> to me? Well, I mean, I would interpret that flow state as like what you were kind of discussing um, that in between. I think that's what they might be referring to. Um, um, say, read the yeah, question. I'll read it again. What re research or resources do you recommend regarding flow state in regards to mental health or navigating creativity? Um, there's a, I do believe it's about the relationship that person has with herself first and the world second. Oh, what's it to do with one's motives for making images? Um, I, yes, I, I think it does have to do, I mean, somebody wrote, I do believe this is about the relationship a person has with herself first, then the world second, also has a lot to do with one's motives for making images. Um, yeah, I don't understand quite the expression flow state, to be honest. So if this person could express it a little bit differently, that would probably help me to answer it better. Um, but yeah, um, if if that's if that would be okay. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, we'll we'll let, a different question. <laughs> we'll, let, we'll let William um, see if if he can define flow state and maybe yeah. restate that question in in different language. To help Sorry me about that. Out. This is what. Oh. Like all oh, the Q and A, hopefully. Oh boy! So I have, a, I have a, an easier question from Yvette, who <laughs> says, "Curious if you have a background in psychology." Oh gosh, no, uh, not at all. But but I will say that um, I am a big reader of nonfiction, and I uh, I definitely something that I'm very very interested in. So yeah. I don't have a background or official education, but I would say I read a lot of books and I listened to tons of podcasts on in that kind of area. So and, and you read psychology today too. So we know that. <laughs> well, actually, that was <laughs> that was just a Google kind of random thing. Oh, okay. I thought you were subscribed to it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mecca, something else. Um 
Any advice on how to determine when work is finished and ready to share? Oh my goodness. I don't know if I have advice for it, but I feel like, um, for me at least, it's like when it's, you know, when I think back about the trauma series and when I decided it was finished, it was just almost like this gut feeling, honestly, like I was like, this is it, this is it, you know, I think when you, you know, there's always something you might want to change, but I, I think you'll know, honestly, that's my only advice. I feel like you'll know when you keep working on it. And another thing is when you keep working on an image and an idea and you won't get there and it just won't go to the place that you wish it would be, maybe just take a step back. And maybe that's not an image that you should be working on. I think that's another advice. Like if something doesn't quite work and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't give you this feeling of like, that's it. I'm going, this is, I love this. And I'm going to add this to my series. Um, you know, just go back and work on something else. <clears throat> it really is for me that sort of gut feeling and and knowing that, yeah, this is, I like this a lot and I want to, I want to share that. Great. Thank you. Okay, along that same vein, um, Janice has a question. How would you suggest a person deals with um, ideas flooding in at one time? As a result, I jump from one shiny object to another. Oh, flooding ideas. Yeah, they hold. <sighs> this is so funny because most of my flooding ideas happen when I'm walking with my dog and I have nothing with me or when I'm taking a shower and I have nothing with me. <laughs> So it's, it's a, it's, um, and I'm sometimes, honestly, I, I mean, I can give advice that I sometimes don't always follow, <laughs> but it's definitely very important to always keep, um, keep a notebook with you um, next to your bed, in your purse, in your car, you know, wherever you're going to be, uh, just keep it there. Keep keep a pen, a notebook, or a piece of paper, anything that you can write down um, your thoughts. I think that I talk a lot about writing as a creative exercise in my workshops, and I, I do believe that even writing just like um, 10 minutes a day or or even just five minutes a day, just writing down some thoughts, not being, not pretending to be a writer, just for yourself, just words and thoughts you had, just write it all down. And um, writing about it, I think really helps um, getting clarity on it. And another thing that I have done before is just recording uh, on, you know, we have our phones everywhere we go, I guess. And so I record, a lot of times I record some ideas or, just, um, yeah, talk to myself when I'm walking. <laughs> okay, Mecca? So in terms of self-reflection upon your work, have you arrived at any possible answers as to why torn was not received and trauma was? Um, not really, to be honest. I mean, I could say maybe it was too similar in some ways or, you know, it's kind of, it, it definitely connected. I almost, could see it as like one body of work. That's kind of how I shared it one time at portfolio review. Um, <clears throat> it at one portfolio reviewer though really did connect with it and um, and gave me some really great feedback on it. And um, I really can say I honestly think sometimes I, there's so many factors that come into play. You know, who are the people who are looking at it? Um, the combination of people who are looking at it, the, the time of day, I mean, any factor can, you know, and then also, I mean, honestly, like, uh, yeah, I mean, I have come to conclusions that I'm like, I could have done this differently, or I would have maybe worked harder on this or things like that. But overall, I would, I'm not exactly sure. And, but right now I'm actually okay with it. Um, but if you are interested, <laughs> It did get recently published on 112, pub, 112 Publishing with an interview about it, which I think is, is nice to, it's, I think it's really good to read about it, plus, um, you know, seeing the images, I, I think it explains it a little bit more. 
so. Okay, um, let's do one more question from me and one more question from Mecca. So I've got an interesting question from uh, JTG, whoever that is, but it's a good question, JTG. Um, how important is place to getting through a creative block? Hmm. Place. Mm -hmm. That is a good question. Um, I, would, I would think it would be hard to get through a creative block uh, and 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 stay in place, stay at home, stay oh, yeah, that's in your place. Sure. So, so mean, moving to a new place maybe is what he's well, kind of getting at. I think that that's true. Like, you know, as I was talking about the awareness of our surroundings, that that's really what nurtures our, our creativity. I think change is very healthy. You know, I think change is is very, very good. And sometimes even just taking a trip, you know, by yourself or sometimes, a, you know, just a road trip somewhere. Absolutely. I think it's it's very healthy to um, to go out into the world and and get some different perspectives and things like that, for sure. Yeah, because mm -hmm. ruts oftentimes have to do with just the the, uh, the routine of our daily lives. Oh, absolutely, yes. Um, get at the same time, go to bed at the same time. Kids, school, absolutely. classes, work. Um, that can can be really really tough on a creative spirit. And I, so, honestly, uh, taking a workshop is one thing. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I vote for that. <laughs> um, I think it's really important connecting with other artists. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's really important not to stay with yourself. I made that mistake early on very much. Like I really stayed just with myself and, you know, this sort of solitary artist life. But I think it's really important to go out and connect with other artists, go to a museum, go to, um, you know, other exhibitions or, or yeah, just any anything that you can do to, um, get out of the routine, change your perspective, learn something new, I think can certainly help to get out of that, for sure. Go to a, go to a concert, go to a movie. Go yeah. Some, some place, uh, somebody else is being creative in a different way than you are. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, changing up routine, I mean, I think that is something we all experienced probably during COVID as well. You know, we were just stuck at home and 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 last year, it was a case of like, I was just, I just felt so occupied with my ordinary life. You know, it was, that was part, another part of it, like where I was just like, I can't get out of this, you know, and, and you don't, that's not nurturing necessarily your inspiration. Um, so, yeah. Okay, Mecca, you have the final question. Make it a good one. <laughs> so I think the best is when you are emerging from a non-productive time, do you start with a disciplined schedule to get you going or do you experiment first and then become more disciplined in regard to production? Mm. Well, <clears throat> I, what I try to do, you know, and I'm not saying I'm always successful at this, but when I'm not touching my camera, um, I definitely try to come up with discipline in other areas. Um, maybe it will be writing, writing my thoughts, um, even writing about, you know, some ideas that maybe pop in, but I just don't have the motivation. So I think, again, like it's, it's kind of, it kind of comes and goes. I don't think you should go through a phase like that without any uh, discipline um, or structure. I think structure is very healthy um, and it's important um, to, you know, to get something done, even when you're in a creative rut, even if you don't take an image or don't paint or don't do anything like that, just come up with something different. Um, most of the time, I will say, if I come out of a process like that, I play, I said, I, but I, but I often, um, I often get inspiration. I think, I think inspiration from, can come from anything around us. It can come from just one line from a book. It can come from one quote. It can come from a movie scene. It can come from anything ar around us. Suddenly you're just like, oh my gosh, that really, really connects with me. And I think that's kind of the seat, the very first step of a creative project. I think play comes almost always next because you want to just kind of dive into and play and experiment and enjoy just feeling inspired. And I think the structure and discipline comes 
a little bit later. It kind of overlaps and goes all, you know, ultimately kind of is all connected. But I think play is always, it's always a healthy thing to start out with. Good place to end, play. <laughs> Great inspirational force for sure. So thank you, Manuela, for playing with us this evening and inspiring us and sharing your heartfelt work and um, also the, um, the angst of being a mother and an artist mm -hmm. and um, just a person in this world, which is filled with so much um, sorrow and, and war and, and just uh, and tough times. And we as creative people want to show that, but we also want to show some hope and joy. And you do that in your work. And we're blessed to have you part of our community. So thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> so Mecca, you want to share, you want to share a final um, slide here so we can um, talk about some of the upcoming programs we have. I think, I hope, I expect that we have. Yes, we do. Huh. So Manuela is coming to Santa Fe, I'm pleased to say, the last week of July, which is a really great time to be in Santa Fe. The monsoon season has started. It's cooled off. Um, and the, the days are just incredibly beautiful. So Manuela is going to be talking about a lot of the things you talked about tonight uh, in an in-person workshop, five days, Monday through Friday where you go out and make photographs in Magical Santa Fe with Manuela and your other students. So um, you can check it online. You can use that QR code there on the left-hand side, find out more about the class. But I highly recommend that if you um, connected and resonated with what Manuela was sharing tonight, that you consider joining her and us in Santa Fe this summer. I'll be there and looking forward to it. So thanks everybody for joining us as creativity continues here at Santa Fe Workshops. Appreciate you being here and um, spread the word of these free lectures. The next one is going to be the end of June with um, John Paul Caponegro and Christina Mittenmeyer from National Geographic. And then in July, we have one with Tammy Bone who's talking about her artistic process. Um, so we have two upcoming ones in, in June and July. So uh, it's a wrap, everybody. Thank you, Manuela, again. Thank you, Mecca. And um, we'll see you again somewhere online or in person in Santa Fe. Thanks, everybody. All right. Good thank night. You, everybody. Bye.